The Eye of the Sun, Part 2, The Tefnut Myth. And Mark Smith, Emeritus Oxford Professor in Egyptology, provided this myth for me. This includes excerpts from the original text of the goddess myth, translated by Mark, and some of the translated material uh, has been put into English for the first time. So prepare for part two of this beautiful myth and prepare for some magical soul-making alchemy. So part two. At the point where the preserved part of the story begins, Thoth, as a baboon, has already made his way to Kush and encountered Tefnut in her form uh, as a Kushite cat. She tells him that she is happy and well looked after in her new home. Needless to say, this complicates his task. But there is a further difficulty. Not only must he find a way to persuade her to return to Egypt, he has to proceed with the utmost caution in doing so, for he knows that if he says or does the wrong thing and angers the goddess, she might transform herself from a gentle cat into a raging lioness and rend him to pieces with her teeth and claws. The baboon tells the cat that wrongdoers are punished for their crimes. To illustrate his point, he tells a story about a vulture and a cat. The vulture lived at the top of a tree in a nest with her fledglings. The cat lived at the base of the tree with her kittens. Each was afraid to go out in search of food for her offspring. The vulture thought that if she left her young unprotected, the cat would attack and kill them, and the cat believed the same about the vulture. One day the vulture told the cat that they could not continue in this way and proposed that they both swear an oath by the sun god Re that one of them, if one of them left their young unprotected, the other would not attack them. Despite their oath, one day when the cat had gone out in search of food for her kittens, the vulture swooped down and carried them off to her nest and fed them to her fledglings. The cat complained to Re that the vulture had violated their oath and begged the sun god to punish her. Accordingly, one day, the vulture saw a man cooking some game which he had caught. She swooped down and snatched some of the meat from the fire and carried it off to her nest. Unknown to her, however, some burning coal still clung to the meat, so when she set it down in her nest, it burned a hole in the bottom and her fledling fledglings fell to the ground and perished. Following this story, the baboon makes an impassioned speech about the importance of having a home, a place where one truly belongs. Everything on earth, there is nothing which they love more than their place of birth, the place where they were born. He tells the cat that the temples of the upper Egyptian gods in Lower Egypt are built so that they open towards Upper Egypt while those of Lower Egypt gods in Upper Egypt open towards Lower Egypt, because the hearts of the gods and mortals are set upon their homes, that they might be content in them once more. The same applies to all living creatures. The crocodile seeks its watery lair and the serpent its hole in the ground. Likewise, plants and trees have their characteristic ecological niche, the only place where they can flourish. The ebony tree, for example, does not grow black in Egypt. Reeds and rushes grow abundantly in the waterways of Punt, a land on the east coast of Africa. But there are no sycamore trees, a typically Egyptian species, there. Conversely, the Persia tree bears abundant fruit in Egypt, but cannot do so on stone. Even minerals have their home and can only be found there. Mountains are a rich source of malachite, a stone whose green colour is like that of the papyrus plant. But as the baboon observes, the green stone does not grow in the water. The papyrus does not grow in the mountain. The baboon goes on to point out that the attractions of other countries, however enticing they may be, are not necessarily superior to those of Egypt, telling the cat 
the foreign lands which sparkle with genuine turquoise are not the equal of a single stalk of barley which grows in your green fields, because the barley provides sustenance and allows everyone to live. One cannot eat turquoise. It is better to dwell in a humble place where you, where you truly belong, where you are valued and you can fulfill your potential than to live in a grand edifice which is totally unsuited to you. In the words of the baboon, they do not build a palace for the bees. A hive made of dung is sweeter than one made of stone. He explains that a hive of stone would be inappropriate for the work for which bees are most valued, that of producing honey, which played an important role in ancient Egypt. The hive of dung is sweeter because of the honeycomb which the bees form in it. The Egyptians actually made beehives of mud or clay from the Nile River mixed with cow's dung. An Egyptian folk tradition held that bees were spontaneously generated from the dung of cows, so by living in a hive made partially of that material, they were, in a sense, returning to their place of origin. The baboon closes his speech about the importance of seeking one's true home by quoting the cat's earlier words. The one who is hungry leaves his town. The one who is satisfied remains in it. Back to her. Only this time altering them slightly to say, the one who is hungry seeks his town. The one who is satisfied does not despise it. Tune in for part three soon.